Hello, and welcome to Ask Tell number 10 on Radio K. I'm Adam Kadri. This is a little bit of a rebranding. Radio K is expanding to cover more topics than just interactive fiction, so I'm splitting it up into different series, and the IF series is henceforth called Ask Tell. Our first game this time around is A New Life by Alexander Owen Muniz, better known on IFMUD as Two Star. It tied for second in the 2005 comp. And back to talk about it with me is Jess Haskins, calling in from New York City, as will soon become apparent. So let's hear about A New Life. So I'm not sure how the IF community would classify or categorize this one. There's a medieval fantasy setting, like less puzzly than I was expecting. And also it seems like not quite an amnesiac character, but a character who's just remembering things as they sort of go through this landscape and meet characters. It's a little unclear what you're trying to do, but it's a pretty small drama involving just a few characters in a small location. And the plot turns out to be like about uncovering memories and these things with different enchantments and different rules of magic in the world. And it's about uncovering this one specific story. It's in the backstory and ultimately like restoring another character's memories. I don't know if there are multiple endings, but there's a walkthrough that gives one path, and I certainly wasn't able to find any other different ways you could go or different things to do, so I'm guessing this is the one true ending to the game. It's interesting that you mention Amnesia, because I thought that this game was in large part an attempt to get away from the curse of the Amnesiac character. IF has a long tradition of games in which you find yourself in a strange place and you don't know who you are or what you're doing and you have to figure out what's going on. So in A New Life, I was struck by how here we have a character who's explicitly not an amnesiac, who is from this world and knows a lot about it and has memories resurfacing at every turn. And you can type in the remember command to pull up those memories. Now I thought that was an interesting idea in theory, but in practice, I wondered, why not just add the memory to the story text instead of reporting two memories available or whatever and making the player actually type remember? Why would you ever not want to read what those memories are? Yeah, I suppose. I mean, oddly enough, the first thing that comes to mind and is an analogy to that is you just kill a monster and then you have to like input another command to loot and get your rewards for the thing you just did. Like, it could just automatically give you the loot. Why would you ever not pick it up? But you've done something, it's made a new thing available, and now you can select it. One thing that actually happened, I think, is sometimes those come up during dialogue. So you might not want to remember right away. You might want to just finish whatever you're doing and then go through the memories like at any time. I think it lets you paste the input yourself rather than you did a bunch of stuff. And then now here's maybe another whole screen of info dump that just automatically happens. I think that might have better simulated the Proustian triggering of memories that just sort of come unbidden as soon as they're triggered and overwhelm you. I guess that would have been a kind of different feel. Yeah, that's a good point. I guess in practice, the memories are kind of like footnotes, and I have to admit that when I read Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell a couple of months ago, I didn't actually read every single one of the footnotes. That's fair enough, and they're often like literally historical footnotes, like, oh, this king lived at this time and did that thing. This is a fact about the world that just happened to come to mind. So, on the subject of facts about the world, I thought that the world building was definitely the strength of this game much more than anything you do in the course of the story. So what did you think about that? The player character is pretty incidental to the story. Like they do exist and live in this world, but they're not a part of the backstory at all. In that sense, they are just a random wanderer. The autobiographical memories seem to be more just a vehicle for delivering world building info sometimes more or less subtly than like an encyclopedia entry. Sometimes it is just an encyclopedia entry, but sometimes it is, for example, the player character's lived experience of this feature where people can flip genders after puberty and, and just giving us the one character in the world their perspective on this feature. But I guess I would expect a game about triggering your memories and a game about losing and gaining memories for the player's biography to matter more, but it really was just a vehicle for delivering this world building. So one thing I was going to flag up before you brought it up explicitly was that you kept referring to the player character as they because your character is currently of the neuter gender, as you discover right away. I mean, I guess it depends on when you examine yourself. That 
tends to be like the first or second move that I make. Something I always forget to do, actually. I don't think I even did in my first playthrough until I like saw it in the walkthrough, maybe. For me, the first time that I got any reference to uh, the player character's gender was when you look at the peddler and it says something about how, you know, she might affect you more if you were still male. One thing that I thought was interesting was making the humans be the one that have this weird gender thing. And then the goblins are, we would consider pretty normal. They're like, oh, they're born male and female and they don't change and they just have kids. And, you know, of course, the most friendly character that gives us the most information and talks to us the most, like, gives us sort of that perspective. But, yeah, I thought it was just interesting to make the humans be the oddball ones instead of just regular humans and then have some other alien fantasy race of weird gender changing people. Yeah, that reminded me a little bit of Battlestar Galactica. I didn't watch a lot of Battlestar Galactica, but I did like how they made the humans polytheists and the enemy robots monotheists to sort of confuse the issue of identification for what I assume is a mostly monotheistic audience. And we get other hints that the humans in this game are not exactly us. Like, you mentioned the peddler. And the game says that you're particularly attracted to her veiny face, because in this world, facial veins are a sign of femininity. But in any case, I had encountered the idea of a version of humanity with malleable gender before in Ursula Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness. But applied to IF, it has a meta component too, in that IF has a long tradition of nameless, featureless player characters supposedly to aid with identification. You know, like, I'm not playing some guy named Guybrush Threepwood, I'm playing me! Except that, inevitably, these games would make some assumptions about you, like that you were fairly young, and that you were able-bodied, and often that you were male. Interestingly, even though you are in the neuter gender, when you look at someone like the peddler, you still get told how you would view her if you were a male. So I thought it was interesting that the male perspective is still inserted, even though like, oh, but you are neuter. Yes, though, while you were most recently male, it does say that you first elected to be female because you idolized your older sister and then got switched against your will. There's a bit where you're talking about your ex and it says, you were both maidens when you fell madly in love. It usually transpires in such circumstances that an imbalance of humors causes one of the partners to transition to male, knowing this didn't prepare you when it happened to you. Afterward, things were never the same. Kolia seemed more distant, less willing to include you in her confidences. Though she never said it, you believed that she was not attracted to the man you became. Yeah, and I mean, obviously one of the most sort of striking things in the story is not just the fact of like changing gender and both it sounds like it sort of happens based on like your life and where you're at once you hit puberty but also that under certain circumstances you can just consciously decide to change um oddly enough that part seemed less striking than the idea of the of course the marriage of dominion which is a big plot point that you know, a marriage of equals is one where you spend equal time trading genders, but you always have to trade genders that are still always heterosexual. And then a marriage of dominion is one where one partner permanently becomes female, and then the male partner is dominant. That almost seems like the more provocative idea. I don't know, even in a weird fantasy world, there has to be some element of regressive gender politics, and that's the one. So you mentioned that the different types of marriages were a plot point. And that brings me to the next topic I wanted to discuss. So I read the prefatory notes for this game, and they suggested that there were many possible stories unfolding within the same space. And I thought, ah, like narcolepsy. All right, sounds good. And then I started into the game, and I learned that I was playing someone fleeing from a war-torn, drought-stricken area of this world, and that I was part of the latest wave of refugees striking out for a new life in the West. And so when I encountered a sign that said, in effect, hey, there's a side quest to the south here, I thought, okay, this must be one of those alternate plot lines, but nah, I'll just stick to my main quest and keep going west. But then it says, oh, you're just so curious, you can't possibly take another step without checking this out. So that was annoying. 
I don't like games in which you're not told what your goal is, but it's not actually an improvement to be told that you have a goal and then not be allowed to pursue it. So I poked around in this southern area, and after the two hours that you're supposed to give a comp game, I turned to the walkthrough to see the rest of the story, and I got to about the 90% mark of the walkthrough, and it stopped working. It said to go north, and the game said I couldn't go that way. So the game I played was about encountering this peddler woman, solving a bunch of puzzles to make it through a barrier, and then wandering into a goblin's house, and the goblin doesn't seem surprised. He's just like, oh, hey, how you doing? You come in the back way? And then I read some of his books, learned more about the history of this world. The end. There were no plot points. The game was just about opening doors. But you're telling me that this world-building stuff and the gameplay did have something to do with each other? Yeah, so spoilers for the ending. It's all basically centered around the backstory of the Tell Bear and Hakon. So the evil enchanter tricked a Telbear into poisoning Hakon, and then Hakon died, the Telbear was grief-stricken, and the goblin decided that it would be kinder to erase her memories with the dragon, whose power is erasing and stealing memories, and the Telbear is now the peddler. And like the key, like the one action that you have to do to unlock all of this, which it would never occur to me to do, is instead of just talk and like ask about different topics you have to ask the peddler about herself and then she starts talking about oh yeah you know had no memories i was in this carriage and i became this peddler and like without hearing her say that you can't get any of the other conversation topics with the goblin about her and like oh i want to help her find her memories and that's just all blocked off unless you ask her about herself and so eventually you get one of the memory seeds that you give to her and she remembers a little scene just a little bit before waking up in the carriage of being attacked and it didn't seem to reveal that much. But then you're supposed to take a seed to protect yourself from the dragon, otherwise it kills you. Let the dragon meet you and then just say, hey, did you take the peddler's memories? I want to give them back to her. And the dragon gives you the scale, which is the token of her memories, and you give her the scale, and then she remembers, like, oh yeah, I killed Hakon, and then I wanted to forget. It's like, well, okay, bye. And your curiosity is satisfied, and you can ride off into the West to your new life. So it, it really is about, like, learning from the goblin about the different parts. Like, if you show him the sword, he tells you the backstory about the enchanter, and if you tell him, like, hey, there's this peddler who lost her memories, then he actually tells you before you even get to that, like, oh, that must be a tell bear. Like, I removed her memories. I don't remember if it was kind or not. But he tells you how to restore her memories. And then, I don't know, I guess she continues on living with that grief that she was willing to forget. But that's, like, not explored at all because I couldn't find any way to, like, say, so how do you feel now? Or what are you going to do? Or what next? It was just that she said that she remembered. Then I guess that removes the barrier. You can just walk west after that and end the game. So it did sort of like tie some of the pieces together about the idea of, you know, the backstory talks about how Atelba was a prince and was proud and didn't want to be subjected to this marriage of dominion, but then actually did come to at least like or love Hakon and then the story of how, you know, they were betrayed. And then she talks about like remembering having been a man before was just changing from being a man to being a woman so she wouldn't be recognized or something when she decides to become a peddler. Anyway, that's a kind of like rambly backstory of how this all fits together. Like I said, it did tie in a lot of the elements together, but as a conclusion, felt like it lacked a like really satisfying ending. Okay, now I'm confused. Like, I played the walkthrough. There were like a hundred commands, and I typed in like 90 of them and had them succeed, and I don't remember any of this stuff. So that's not a very good walkthrough. The walkthrough itself is weird. There's a lot of stuff in it that is just like random things that I guess, you know, he wanted you to see like, hey, touch the mud, then wash your hands in the river. Totally random thing to do, does nothing, but it's part of the walkthrough. At one point, I was very stuck because my lamp broke and I couldn't get through the dark part, so I couldn't even get back out to the outside to like talk to the peddler anymore. And so I'm like, well, it's supposed to be no no win situations, but I guess I'm in one, so I give up, I'll restart the game. 
And then I did again, but things like, I think you can only see the dragon once. So after seeing the dragon, if you haven't learned about the peddler, the dragon is just like, you don't know why you're here, go away. And I could never get the dragon to come back again. Just some things you have to ask about in the right order. Like I said, you have to ask about the peddler at the right time before you do other things and like follow those conversational things. So I actually found it kind of hard to get to the end without cutting all the extraneous stuff out of the walkthrough. But I did get to the ending twice, so once in that final playthrough, and then again just now when I was refreshing myself. And it really is quick. You don't really have to bother with many of the items at all. I mean, I guess maybe that's part of the idea of there are multiple stories happening in the same place. Maybe without a walkthrough that talks about them, I wasn't able to figure out, for instance, the bags. I you know, did some stuff with them, but I never figured out the point, and I feel like I never got what was supposed to happen with the bags. The staff also was not really that useful. You can get through the whole game without the staff. The sword, like there's the bit where you use it to find out the backstory, but then the goblin tells you how dangerous it is and asks you to give it to him. And I decided this last time to just hang on to it and see what happens. Like maybe it'll betray me and it'll ruin the ending or something if I have it with me and nothing, nothing happened. There was like the thing with the standing stones, which there was like a glass on top of it and something inside. And I felt like there was some puzzle there, something to dig out that I could never quite figure out. So maybe those are all the other stories happening in the same space. And it's actually much more expansive. Maybe it's something like the main plot where if you don't do one not quite obvious action, like ask Peddler about herself early to unlock the things, you'll never just stumble on it. But the silver whistle, I never got that to do anything. Just lots of little parts that none of them are essential to getting this one ending of giving the peddler back her memories. You know, when I was playing this a day or two ago, I thought, all right, as a story and as a game, it leaves a lot to be desired, but it has a lot of cool world building stuff. So I guess my impression overall is mildly positive. But the more I'm hearing about all this stuff, the more this game seems like kind of a fiasco. I mean, it might just be a few, like, more in the game design and accessibility things, because I think a lot of those elements actually do kind of fit together well thematically. I thought it was going to be a lot more puzzle-oriented, like there's some really hardcore puzzle with the barrier and the magic items involving understanding the nature of the barrier and the magic items and manipulating them in such a way as to get important pieces to cross from one to the other. Like, I thought there was some whole game I had to play with, like getting the bags to be happy so that I could put things into them and then I could carry them through the barrier if they were in the bag, and enchanting and unenchanting things. And that turned out to be not really that big of a thing. I feel like a lot of it was just uncovering those pieces of backstory about the world. So maybe the point of the puzzles was not so much to like open things or move things or manipulate things, but just to explore more and trigger memories that would give you more information to kind of piece the plot together and figure out what was happening. It was the kind of like moving puzzle pieces in your head rather than in the world. But I think just some of the obscurity of some of the commands kind of stood in the way of making that as elegant as it could have been maybe. Okay, but here's what I mean. Take the conversation system. You can talk to characters in two ways. You can type, talk to the character, and the game will give you a few lines of dialogue to choose from, or you can ask about topics of your own choice. But I quickly gave up on Ask Tell because when I met the Goblin Scholar, I asked him about eight different things in the game that seemed important, like the seeds, and the game kept replying, you can't think of anything to say. So I thought, Wow, all these characters are seriously lacking. They only know about, what, like three things. But from what you're saying, it sounds like they have hundreds of responses, but you're just not allowed to ask them about those things and get those responses until you trip some trigger. That is terrible design. I struggled with the conversation system because well, I didn't notice the status line, like how many lines you had. I actually was approaching it at first as if it was just keyword driven and running into a lot of the same problems as you that just a lot of the really important keywords had no response. And another thing is like if I asked something and then there were like some follow up topics, which happens a lot, I wouldn't notice. And if you ask about something else, you just lose those follow up topics forever. So I missed a lot of important information that way. And I think it would have been a lot stronger if it just stuck to one model or the other. Either have everything be that like menu driven and as soon as you hit one of those triggers or acquire, 
an important item or, you know, encounter a thing that's meaningful to ask about that this should just be there. When you talk to the person, it's like, hey, let me ask you about this thing I found and let me show you this thing I have and what more do you know about that? That would have, I think, gotten me to the end a lot faster. So that way, at least you know what the character knows about. Or if it just committed fully to the more traditional ask, show, tell, plus keyword thing, but then was a lot more responsive that actually did respond to all of these topics that you do know about that are definitely important and gave you hints to sort of nudge you towards the kinds of things that you can talk about. And also, if it were repeatable, because if you go through one of those menu-driven options or if you ask someone about a topic once, it doesn't even say, like, you've already talked about that or, you know, you've already been through that line of conversation. It just gives you the default. You can't think of anything to say, even if it was a really important thing. Maybe you just want to see it again. So, yeah, I think this hybrid system gave, you know, once I at least started noticing every time there were topics available and following them all up, that gave me some kind of illusion of completeness, where again, some of the really important gates to the content are showing something or asking about a topic that's not just an automatic one. And that's another thing. I had all these objects, and here were some people who were supposed to be authorities on these objects, so I thought I'd start showing or giving them the objects to see what they could tell me, and the game always said, oh, the goblin scholar is unimpressed or whatever. And after that happened half a dozen times, I thought, okay, I guess this game just doesn't involve showing and giving. And now you're telling me that it does. And just, where did this guy get the idea that that was good game design? I'll come up with all this content and then hide it in a way that you'll never suspect it's there. I feel like a lot of it is mind reading problems. And a lot is just, you know, lackluster, incomplete implementation, like not enough synonyms, not enough edge cases, not enough unique responses to good input. Just as an example, talking to the peddler, the peddler is, you know, sitting in front of this array of items. And if you try asking about the items, like half of them have a response. If you're like, ask about staff, then she starts talking about staff. And if you say, ask about lamp, that's not something you know about. It's like, it's right there. It's sitting in front of you. Just tell me about your items. Like, it's not even like the set of four things that are here are not even treated consistently. So to that extent, I think it's just kind of a certain sloppiness and implementation. I just tried that in the other window here, and you're absolutely right. That's ridiculous. If there are five items for sale, the character has to have something to say about all five. That's just basic craft. What the hell? It's actually, uh, I think, just sloppiness. Like, some of the topics would happen out of order. Like, after I'd already, like, you know, talked about the peddler and the problems and been given a seed for that, if you then ask about seed later, it'll, like, give you more basic information and, like, give you another seed that you don't even need. So it's just, like, disjointed bits that you can access out of order in a way that doesn't even make logical sense. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I also encountered a lot of stuff out of order. Like, some of my dialogue options had me asking characters about goblins before I even knew goblins existed. I'm sitting at my keyboard looking at the screen and I'm like, goblins? At one point, the game referred to a door as a bookcase. And then later when you open the door, you discover that it's a bookcase on the other side. But I didn't know that yet. To me, it was just a door. Why are you calling it a bookcase? It's interesting, though. My early experience, you know, just as a counterpoint, was kind of the exact opposite. I started out thinking about how responsive the world seemed, how, like, everything I tried had a really good response, like, even just random stuff, like, I'm, you know, looking through my inventory items, and, like, there's a coin, and just said to try to flip coin, and he says, oh, it goes in an arc through the air. I'm like, oh, neat, and I caught it catch it and then you look at it and see the reverse it's like i didn't even expect any of those actions to work and the goblin girl was one of my favorite characters i like you know met her early on and this is when i was still having trouble drawing words out of the peddler i don't think i'd met the goblin scholar yet but this girl was here and everything i tried with her worked which was really nice like i'd show her stuff and she'd react i played her music and she liked that i gave her things and she'd look at them and turn them over and then hand them back to me and I'm like wow this is like super responsive and nice i like wasn't running into any of the weird edge cases so maybe i was just 
lucky there. Maybe it's sort of like inconsistently applied within smaller contexts. But yeah, I started out actually thinking the exact opposite about the way interactivity was implemented in this game and actually being kind of impressed. It's kind of unfortunate that that turned out not to be true. <laughs> yeah, whereas I didn't even know it was a goblin girl. I encountered the eyes staring at me, but I could not get anything to work to progress past that point. Now, I can't say that the game as you've described it sounds all that great. Like, you read about a king and da-da-da, it turns out that the king is secretly the only other human character in the game. Great. But still, I had to hear that from you, because when I actually played the game, nothing triggered. Except for me, I guess. I am now triggered. It feels like I came into this segment thinking that this game was like a cafe with great decor, but just like a couple of muffins in the display case. And now I find out that it's even worse, that there actually was a full service menu, but no one told me because they don't serve my kind or something. I keep wondering how much there was to the parts of the game that I didn't fully figure out, like the rules of enchantment and all this stuff about the proper care of your magical bags. You have to show them respect and they'll only carry certain things and the whole notion of ownership. I wish I'd been able to figure that out or at least that the walkthrough had covered some of those things so I could have seen that content because I was really curious where those things were all leading. Also like the other guy that you find sleeping in the ruins in most of my attempts at playing through, I had to steal his belongings. You know, I had to then convince them that they belonged to me so that I could take them through the barrier and do things with them and make them happy. And that never quite panned out. And I never quite figured out what was the importance of this guy sitting there, although the goblin will tell you a little bit about him if you follow the right prompts. But yeah, it just looked like little corners of the world that I couldn't quite get at. And I wonder if I saw those, like, if it would all, like, click into place. Like, wow, this is all, like, fantastically interrelated, or just, oh, this is another little thing that you could do if you found it. Again, that idea, I guess, of many stories in the same space. Maybe some of them can even be main stories, and maybe instead of giving the peddler back your memories, there's some, like, resolve the story of this sleeping guy who faced the dragon, and maybe that's a whole story and ending, but I guess we just don't know. And I liked the world building and the characters and this backstory and everything. And the small moments where it was fluid were really nice. I just kind of wish the whole game had been like that and that it were easier to come to that ending and reach that conclusion without having to like specifically follow the very few strange steps in the walkthrough. And it's pretty much my summation of the whole experience. All right, next up we have Chancellor by Kevin Vensky. It qualified for Ask Tell by getting nominated for Best Game in the 2005 Zizzy Awards, but it only came in ninth in the comp, which suggests that we're probably looking at a game with a handful of partisans. So here to discuss whether those partisans were onto something is Laura Hubbard. So Chancellor starts off looking like one of those pseudo-medieval fantasy games. You're 20 years old, and according to the ways of your people, the time has come for you to undergo some sort of trials that you are apparently unlikely to survive. But if you do, then it seems that you will be deemed an adult woman and be able to take your place in society or something. One of the trials is that you have to outwit a sentient mountain who tries to eat you. But then you wake up in a dorm room in the present day, and it turns out that you're a college student. You're the RA of your floor, though this game calls you the Chancellor of the Floor. Because even though the game is set in the United States, the author has a .fr email address, and there are some weird linguistic quirks like that. Anyway, so you wander around doing stuff. Nearly dying of hunger for no reason. Nearly dying of hunger for no reason. And it starts to look like this might now be a mystery, since there are a couple of rooms you can get into, and you get hints of something suspicious going on. Did you spend any time going up and down the dorm hall, knocking on people's doors and learning about who lived there? I did, yeah. That is the sort of thing I am into. What did you think about the people and how they were characterized? I don't know. Since they were just descriptions and not depictions, it's kind of hard to say. I wish the characters had actually been around to interact with, but this is one of those games that goes to great lengths to put you in empty spaces. Maybe I'm asking too much of just looking at these incidental parts of the map, but I like kept waiting for something to surprise me 
for something to be anything but stereotypical, anything that was like, oh, interesting, instead of like, yeah, that's a room with people in it. So like, for example, there was one room that they were both really into anime. And it was just every stereotype that you could think of. I liked that you could explore the map, though, because it was the only place in the game that you could actually do that sort of exploration. Right. But before you can explore too much, you eventually flip back to the fantasy world and then back to the dorm. And that's as far as I got. Like, I got to scene four and it was fantasy, dorm, fantasy, dorm. And then there's one more fantasy dorm. And then that's where I died because there ended up being a person who was in the dorm who killed me. Do you want the unspoiled for you that I got? Sure. Lay it on me. You see this janitor. And as I'm walking around, I realize that the only thing to do is to go where the janitor doesn't want you to go. So once you are insistent and type in the command several times, you go past him and then he starts hitting you with a mop. And then stabbing you and chasing you around the building, stabbing you until you die. You know how people have canes that pull apart and there's a knife or a sword? Yes, I have seen those things. He has that but a mop. Well, all right. I see you've played Naughty Moppy before. Just so ridiculous. I don't really understand what happened, and I don't really care to. (laughs) So between the carnivorous mountains and stabby janitors, I guess you could call this fantasy horror? Uh, It looks like the IFDB just calls it fantasy slash surreal. I could definitely see where this could fit into the interactive fiction version of weird fiction, which is kind of a movement that's been going on in literature. What is weird fiction apart from fiction that is weird? It's sort of a self-imposed genre. Writers like China Miebel. Oh, wrote City in the City, Jeff Vandermeer, who wrote the Southern Reach trilogy, is another really good example. Not quite fantasy enough to be horror and never explained. I kind of think about it as the English version of magical realism. Cool enough. The City in the City is probably my favorite of the 30 or so books that I've read for the visitor recommendation series on my website. So if that is what weird fiction is, then maybe weird fiction is for me. It's a better example. (laughs) So unless I'm misremembering, Chancellor is the first game I've played for this show that has no walkthrough. There are some hints, but they're very perfunctory hints. I went well over the two hours that comp games are supposed to get, and the place where I finally quit was when there were some noises, and the hint said, The noises lead you to a room with two items whose purpose can be found by trying them with everything that seems appropriate. And I'm sitting there thinking, look, I don't know what my goals are. I don't even know what's going on. But I'm supposed to just randomly pick up items whose purpose I don't understand and try brute forcing my way through the game by doing everything I can think of with them and every other object I see until I stumble across a response that demonstrates how they might be useful in accomplishing my goals, which, as noted, I still don't even know. How is that fun? Oh, Adam, when you do figure it out, you go to the washing room and the washer is going and you look in the washer and eventually you find a coin and a mechanics key. And there's this like really weird part where you're musing on the fact that mechanics get paid more than janitors and you put the coin in the washer and it starts up again. I don't really understand why you do that. Like, if it changes anything in the situation around you, I've noticed this game a lot of times, like, you'll do something, and there's no reaction in the game as a whole, but then you go and the map has changed in some way, which, for an already infuriating map, makes it even more infuriating. But then the mechanics key, you, like, go and open the elevator, and then it took me another 15 minutes to figure out that you're supposed to jump into the elevator shaft. So it's incredibly unfulfilling, even when you find the two objects and complete the goal of whatever it is that you're supposed to be doing. Sounds like someone's been watching too much L.A. Law. It's interesting that you describe the map as infuriating, because another thing that struck me as I was playing was that, for some reason, moving around felt like more of a pain than it normally is in these games. 
getting from place to place was so unintuitive that I thought that I should probably get out some graph paper and make a map, but then I was like, how is that fun? Normally I don't actually need to do that, but something about the layout of locations in this game made it hard for me to wrap my head around. It felt like a weird tangle. And the fact that it's not consistent, and some of the point is sometimes that it's not consistent, makes it even more frustrating. So when you're in the woods and you're looking for the lake, I noticed that I could go 15, go whatever directions in one way, and then get back to where the girl was in five, which on the one hand was kind of nice, but it wasn't consistent. I'm not a fan of moving around by compass directions in the first place. Like, if you're out in the wild exploring with a compass in hand, fine. But if you're in your house, you should just be able to type, go to kitchen, and be in the kitchen. And I recognize that my criticisms here are pretty generic, like the vast majority of IF games from 1973 to 2005 used compass directions to move around, and I assume that continued after 2005, I guess we'll see. But in this case, if I understand you right, even if I had drawn a map, it wouldn't have helped? Yeah, and in a couple scenes, part of the point was that the map changed, but at the same time, by that point, I'd just kind of given up on trying to keep track of anything. Okay. So it sounds like the author might have a case in saying that it's unfair to complain that the game has a confusing map when the map being confusing is one of the gimmicks of the game. I get the whole Zarfian, yes, it's deliberate thing, but that doesn't make it fun. And then you have the puzzles. Now, it's one thing when an author has one puzzle solution in mind and doesn't even think of any alternatives, but here it seemed like the author came up with a bunch of puzzles and had exactly one solution in mind for each of them, but did think of the alternatives. So a lot of the game is an exercise in making excuses for why those alternate solutions don't work. Like, there's a bit where you're trying to get an object suspended from a rope over your head. When I tried burning the rope with my torch, the game recognized that I could do that, but it wouldn't let me. And then I tried throwing my shoe, and it was the same deal. And just, if you recognize that something is an alternate solution, why write some excuse for why it doesn't work? Why not just let it work? Another example of that in that same scene is that what I tried to do was you're allowed to climb the trees. So I tried to climb the tree and untie the rope, and it did not recognize that you could get up to the rope. It's like, you climb the tree, and then it's like, untie rope. It's like, there doesn't seem to be a rope here, which was a little strange. See, that at least sounds like bad implementation, like the author didn't think of it. Sloppiness is bad, but in some ways the obstinacy I'm talking about is kind of worse. I also really wanted the armor. At that point, I realized it didn't do anything for the story, but I just wanted it a lot. And so I spent a lot of time trying to figure that out. So for you to understand like exactly how much I played with this game, I went through 768 moves before I died. Holy guacamole. Yeah. But I was just really frustrated. I was like, I just really want this thing. I know it's not important to the plot, but can I please just have this unimportant thing? And on the flip side, there are a bunch of things that you're told that you can't do, and then the way to proceed is to just do them anyway and be insistent about it. Like, early on you're told that you're passing an impenetrable wood, and if you try entering it using compass directions, it won't let you. But you actually do have to get in there to make any progress, and the way that you do that is by typing enter wood twice. And once again, my question is, how is that fun? I see where the challenge comes from, but where does the enjoyment come from? And I guess that takes me to your point a second ago about wanting the armor. One big source of enjoyment is when players try things, and they work. So for more enjoyment, let more of the things the players try work. When I got frustrated with the whole, like, why am I here as a character, really that's how I got some of the breakthroughs that I got in terms of moving things forward. I just got so frustrated that I was like, can I just throw the character down an elevator shaft? Can I die? And I think that it would have been more fulfilling to me if the first time I did that, when I went on the balcony in the dorm room, they were like, 
Like you jumped off the balcony, you died. Would you like to go back to the last save point? Because then it would be like, at least you're allowing me to do what I want to do, even if it's ending in a situation that I don't want. So it sounds like neither of us were fans of this one, to say the least, but this game and others like it have given me a better sense of what I'm looking for in IF. So first of all, I want a clear scenario, not here you are in this confusing place and you don't know what's going on and figuring it out is the whole point. There were a few points I was like, why am I doing this? I was like, why is my dad throwing me out of the house? And I just in desperation typed in think. And I was like, does she know anything about her life? What is going on? And it's one of those cases where like, I wanted to care about what was going on. But because there's absolutely no background, you have this character who is supposed to be a blank slate, but obviously isn't and obviously does have a backstory, which was really weird. Yeah, the remember command from A New Life could have come in handy here. But just knowing what's going on isn't enough. I also want a goal to achieve. And it's fine if I get to select my goal, like in Whom the Telling Changed, but I don't ever want to just be wandering around looking for something to do. And once I have my goal, what makes the game interactive should be that I have lots of potential strategies to achieve that goal. I want to have like five ideas of what to do next, not one, and definitely not zero. And whichever strategy I pursue, it should lead to some sort of interesting story. Getting stuck should just not be a thing ever. Now there are people who'll say, if you don't want a challenge, why not just read a book? But to me, it seems like, Reading a book is like getting into a tour bus and being taken down a path, and maybe you see some awesome things. I mean, I like reading books, but where IF can trump books, though I guess that verb's been poisoned by recent events. Maybe slightly. But where interactive fiction can take storytelling to another level is that you can drive the bus and pursue the storylines that interest you. Unfortunately, most IF is like, this bus is broken, fix the bus. Yeah, I think it, a lot of it comes down to what your belief is about the core of IF. So, and you kind of hit the nail on the head. Like, some people think, like, oh, it needs to be this puzzle that you're figuring out. And others, and I think I fall into this camp, too, where it's, like, it's this really exciting exploration, which sounds like that's the side you're on, too. And sometimes when I get the pushback of, oh, like, if you didn't want a challenge, why are you doing IF? I'm, I just kind of think there's a certain amount of ego there. That's not what this is about. This is about experiencing a story. It's not about proving how smart you are to a computer. You know, that reminds me. When I wrote Photopia, low these many years ago, I didn't really know what I was doing. Like, I had this idea for an interactive story, but I didn't know to what extent that story was breaking with the traditions of IF. So it was interesting to read the reviews and see other people point out the ways that it did. And one of those reviews said that this was a game that wasn't interested in, quote, some battle of wits between author and player. And I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in, like the title page of Photopia says, telling a story together. But up to 2005 at least, it seems like most authors are still into the battle of wits. Our final game for this installment is Finding Martin by Gayla Wenstrom. It was also nominated for Best Game in the 05 Zizzies, and back to talk about it with me is Janice Eisen. So there's an obscure game from 1997 that made an impression on me as an example of bad integration between puzzles and plot. It's called A Good Breakfast. In A Good Breakfast, you need a spoon. If you go looking for a spoon, you will not find one. What you do is you run into a robot and you play a game of lights out with it because, you know, who can resist a game of lights out? And if you win, the robot unexpectedly gives you a spoon. Then you get locked out of your house and to get back in, you have to rotate the garden gnomes because for some reason that's how the door works. So I start up finding Martin and the first thing you have to do is dink around with the garden gnomes to unlock the front door of the house. This did not augur well. <laughs> to my surprise, it turns out that Finding Martin is not just a puzzle fest. It's a multi-generational, multicultural family saga. Mm -hmm. But by that point, I'd already given up and gone looking for a walkthrough. I love me an old-fashioned puzzle fest, but I'd say it has a serious pacing problem. 
during the first third of the game, I literally got bored and had to make myself keep going more than once because the narrative doesn't really get going until you've gotten a third of the way through. The stakes were not high enough. You get this phone call telling you to look for an old friend who's disappeared. And, you know, you don't even know anything really about Martin to start out with. And if you're going to keep going through all this stuff, and given the later plot, it should have been easy to give it more stakes. Maybe once upon a time he had a crush on Rachel. Maybe he and Martin were once very close and the PC feels guilty about not keeping up with him. Or even... A couple of memories that he has about Martin. If you're going to get people to play such a long game, they have to care. I was invested by two-thirds of the way through, but that's much too late. And I've seen people in a couple different places online wondering why this game has fallen into obscurity. And I suspect that the main reason, I suspect most people didn't keep playing long enough to get to the interesting part. <laughs> Well, it seems like that setup was a deliberate decision. The author actually makes a big deal of having the player character wonder, why am I the one finding Martin? Why would Rachel contact me about this when she's never even met me? And then as the plot unfolds, you find out that because there's a time travel element, the things you do in the past end up setting the whole thing in motion. But of course, just because something is deliberate doesn't necessarily make it a good idea. You still have to give it some stakes sooner by the time Rachel became important again, I mean, you got the phone call from her and you saw her in the photo, and then it's not for a long time that she comes up again. I had literally forgotten who Rachel was. Right. We really do need to talk about how long this thing is. See, when I did go looking for a walkthrough, what I found instead was a transcript of a winning playthrough, and this transcript is about 125,000 words long. And note, that's not all the text in the game. That's only what you see if you do everything perfectly. Trinity was one of Infocom's largest games. They needed the new Interactive Fiction Plus format to fit it all in. And a winning transcript of Trinity is under 17,000 words. So Finding Martin is like seven Trinities in a row and then some. Now throw in the fact that this is a really hard game. Like, if this were a book, it might take you a week to figure out how to get from page 7 to page 8. And you still have hundreds upon hundreds of pages to go. And then you have to go back and read pages 7 and 8 over and over again, because there's still the constant retracing the same route over and over again, which in a shorter game might not be a problem. But at this length, I just got so tired of walking from the dance studio to the lab and back or whatever. The number of videos you can run is just ridiculous, and I can't imagine too many people are going to go through all of them. An example is, without the walkthrough, I would never have solved the dance studio puzzle. Even though I'm a big Fred Astaire fan, I'm familiar with the dance scene where he dances with a hat rack, and by the time the clip showed up, I didn't remember there'd even been a coat rack in the lab. Whereas I don't really know anything about Fred Astaire, which raises an issue that I've been mumbling about for 20 years now. I'm sure you're familiar with the oddly angled room puzzle from Zork 2. Oh, the baseball puzzle. Right, it required that players be familiar with the rules of baseball, and European players were annoyed, to say the least. But there have been any number of games over the years that revolved around fixing a spaceship or a toaster or whatever. And to me, like, you might as well ask me the starting rotation of the 1983 Padres or something. And people say, no, one is cultural knowledge, but the other is accessible to all. But it's not. If you're not mechanically inclined, it's not accessible. Whether you're doing a math-based logic puzzle, or one based on identifying different models of Korean ball-jointed dolls, you're writing for a subset of the population. So I was interested to see this author embrace that and go ahead and put in cultural knowledge puzzles. One that springs to mind is the one in which you have to get a passcode by associating numbers with names. So Bashful stands for seven because there are seven dwarfs in the fairy tale, and Blitzen stands for eight because there are eight reindeer in the Christmas poem, and you just have to know those things. One of them actually doesn't work anymore. Since this game is from 2005, it says that there are nine planets because Pluto wasn't demoted until 06. When you talk about cultural knowledge, it's not like there's some absolute standard of what's playable and what isn't, which is why I think playtesting is so important, and preferably with a somewhat diverse group of testers, you can figure out which of your puzzles 
doesn't make sense to anybody but you or is too obscure for most people to figure out. There were a lot of jokes and references, and fortunately, I share most of the author's nerdy cultural reference, so I think I got most of them. But she had a number of puzzles where you had to sing songs, and most of them I knew, but there was one crucial puzzle that involved singing a song I'd never even heard of, and she tried to clue it by describing the car the cat was under, but I didn't get it because I had never heard of the song. Yeah, the Little Nash Rambler. Yes, the Little Nash Rambler, that's it. I didn't even know that was a song. Nor did I. I looked it up later, and it turns out that it's a novelty song from 1958. You know, speaking of appealing to a subset of the population. It really sometimes feels like it was written for the author and her friends. Yeah, almost everybody's guilty of this to one degree or another, but the feeling I got from this game was of an author saying, I'm going to include everything in the world that I like. I just want to give a shout out to all of it. Douglas Adams would be at the top of the list. You know, I actually went looking up, when did he die? Was this written right after he died? Is that why the constant, oh, Douglas Adams is wonderful thing? But no. You've also got Alice in Wonderland and all of those scientists and the old movies and the old jokes like the surrealist changing a light bulb. And from the notes, it seems like there were also a lot of family in-jokes and stuff like that. So it did feel like a lot of the time the author was just having her own fun and wasn't really super concerned about whether the audience was included. And some authors admit that proudly, you know? They say, I don't write to entertain you, I write to express myself. I don't know whether this author falls into that camp, but personally, I've always found that it's hard to stay motivated without feedback. So after putting all that time and effort into this game and not really getting much of a response from the community, it might explain why this author disappeared from the IF scene. I am sorry that as far as I can tell, the author never wrote any more games because she's certainly very interesting. And the detail in the game is astonishing. And with a few minor exceptions, it's really well implemented, especially the time travel, which seems like it would be very difficult. Yeah, in a previous segment, we covered a game called All Things Devours, which is an intricate time travel piece. But while in All Things Devours, there wasn't anything else, in Finding Martin, the time travel is even more intricate, and there's even more of it, but it's only like 2% of the game. Overall, I would say I enjoyed the game, but it has a lot of flaws, and especially for such a long game, some of them, I think, were mortal to it getting some sort of permanent place in the IF pantheon, or even as a game that people remembered and thought well of. If she had stuck around and written more games, she might have gotten to a better balance on that point. Well, I guess that's what happens when you pack all your ideas into one giant game. What's left for game number two? And nothing is left for Ask Tell number 10 on Radio K. Many thanks to my guests, Jess Haskins, Laura Hubbard, and Janice Eisen, and to the authors of the games, Alexander Owen Munez, Kevin Vensky, and Gayla Wenstrom. And thank you for listening. Bye for now. Bye for now.